Yeah, I think that's exactly what's happened. You know, the entire way that Putin has placed his claim to legitimacy has always been through this idea that he is a strong man who can provide stability and that some level of potentially repression is is acceptable if it's in the service, you know, if it's to serve this broader broader mission of stability. I think this has really massively undermined his core claim as to what he's even doing and how capable he is of doing it. And what about the wider Russian public? Has the uh, Wagner rebellion rattled some of his supporters? Yeah, certainly. So what we've seen is a few really interesting examples of how the sort of surface level um, if not like support, but certainly acquiescence that Putin's enjoyed from the people, we've seen that sort of shown up for being relatively shallow. So in various places like in Rostov, where the Wagner fighters managed to um, take control of the city, you know, they had a really positive reception from a lot of the civilians there. And actually they were, you know, when they left, they received support. People were chanting um, the name of the, the Wagner Corporation. And um, this is really quite, quite concerning, I think, for the Kremlin leadership, because it shows just how easy it is to mobilize support if you appear to be um, roughly competent um, and roughly capable of serving the sort of broader state interests. I think this has really rattled the Kremlin terribly. Yeah, so within the Kremlin itself, are we expecting forces that hope to one day um, be the next Vladimir Putin uh, or to overtake him in some way or form, would there be murmurings in the Kremlin uh, privately? So, I mean, I don't want to overstate this and paint it as being, you know, um, that it's going to lead to something directly or imminently. But I think what it absolutely has done has shown up just how fragile um, the support base for Putin is. So he's kind of had to really work hard at balancing so many state interests, so many groups of competing elites. And up until now, he's done it relatively well. Now, the war has really put that into question because a lot of those elite groups that he relies on for his support actually are not doing too well out of the war. So there was always a little bit of um, surface level um, discontent. And this has shown just how far and how dramatic that can go. Um, Clearly, Prigozhin never had um, the level of elite support that he would have needed to take this somewhere. But certainly, it's a very unpleasant indicator, I think, for the Kremlin that things are not all well, that it is actually quite hard work to keep those competing factions happy. And I think it will put ideas into the minds of some of those dissatisfied parties about the ways in which they might be able to um, achieve their own ends within this quite fragile system. And what do you think, think are Prigozhin's uh, next moves uh, beyond uh, uh, his uh, time in Belarus? To be honest, I think this is a really tricky one to call because, um, you know, if you try and look at the entire affair from just a strategic or logical perspective, it's really hard to do. You know, the idea that you would kind of take such um, decisive action, but then kind of pull back at the last minute. There's obviously quite a lot going on in the background that I think we're not party to. Um, so it's quite tricky to, to work out exactly what he's been promised and how much store he would set in that. Um, certainly, Putin has already kind of backtracked on the way he initially responded to this. You know, at first, Prigozhin was a traitor and this needed stepping on. Um, then, you know, it all could be forgiven if he would go to exile in Belarus. And actually, Wagner's still got quite an important role to play for the Russian state. You know, tomorrow the story could be entirely different. I think this is a regime really struggling to work out the best way to deal with the implications of what is a massive systemic shock. And I think all the players involved in this are, are basically constantly shifting their positions and trying to work out what, what is best for each of them individually. You know, there's a lot of individual personal issues at play here beyond the kind of big political and geopolitical matters. And sometimes we forget that, I think. And of course, there is always the propaganda war we're talking about. And how do you think the Kremlin uh, will be doing to rectify? What will, will they be doing to rectify this, this damage? Um, you know, if you have a, a dark sense of humor, it's quite amusing how they're trying to deal with this kind of damage because we have had, like I said, Putin himself has kind of flip-flopped on how he's dealt with this. He's really desperately tried to claw back some kind of credibility with his public addresses. Um, but he's kind of directly contradicting himself and a sort of indicator of how much of a systemic shock this has been 
you can see in how it's played out in um, state-run media. So essentially, we had the very initial reports after the deal was struck with Prigozhin. They still followed that earlier Putin line of, you know, this is traitorous, this is a really big problem, just shortly after Putin had essentially done an about-face. So they just don't have time to fully coordinate how they are... Um, uh, how they're 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 prosecuting this PR strategy? You can see that level of disarray. So really, it's not particularly um, effective, I wouldn't say. And it's also kind of very clear that the things that happen on the ground, so the way that you know footage of how people have reacted to Wagner, for example, um, the wider population is seeing this, and it really draws into question the, the main propaganda narratives that the Kremlin's trying to pump out there. Yeah, and you touched on credibility. So when uh, Vladimir Putin next visits his allies in the region and uh, further afield, will he be received differently given the, the, the course of the wider Ukraine conflict? I think it's very interesting when you think about the power play between key individuals. You know, um, for President Lukashenko of Belarus, he couldn't have hoped for a better way to make himself more relevant. You know, for years, he's wanted to project himself into the center of regional power. Um, you know, I think he had designs on a sort of joint Russia-Belarus presidency once upon a time. So this is wonderful for him. And at the same time, it's really very embarrassing for Putin to be relying on someone who he's always essentially seen as like a client basically. So certainly it undermines those key kind of relationships on which a lot of the politics of, of the region has been built over the years. So it will be very interesting to see how this plays out and how explicitly some of those regional players um, will kind of lean into these new power dynamics that it's brought up. And finally, how much of an upper hand does this fiasco uh, give Ukraine and its allies both politically and on the battlefield? I think there's a, a number of ways in which it's helped. So obviously, you know, with the Russian leadership distracted, we saw some fairly significant territorial gains from Ukraine. Um, but it's also you've got to think about the very important um, morale side of things, because you see Ukrainian morale, um, you know, essentially grabbing popcorn, watching this disaster. Ukrainian morale has gone right up just as Russian morale has gone right down. And the ability of, of the Russian side to actually integrate its armed forces is clearly severely weakened through this. So I think we're going to see persistent effects of this going forward. Okay, Dr. Precious uh, Chatterjee, duty. really good to get your thoughts. Thanks very much. Thanks.